I got into Bitcoin in 2013 because I lived the European banking crisis and obviously the financial crisis. But the European banking crisis was very similar to what's happening now. The local bank in the village that I went in went under and took everybody's deposits. They bailed them in. Um, we had a run on deposits, liquidity issues. They were invested in things that were illiquid, which was real estate. Real estate market had come under pressure. Very, very similar. Too many small banks in Europe. Um, and so Draghi backstopped the whole lot. So I saw this and I realized that there was no trust in the financial system. I Nobody knew who owned what when Lehman went under. And they were terrified of others going under because of the same issue, because the daisy chains of collateral are everywhere in this market. And then when you realize in a bank, you don't actually own your money. And people are now realizing that. And the treasurer and the Fed are like, well, 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 we'll just pretend that's OK. That drives people into this parallel financial system. I got into Bitcoin 2013 for exactly this reason and have been an active participant of the market ever since. Bitcoin headed back to $28,000 on March 29th as a classic short squeeze took the market to five-day highs. The abrupt uptick came courtesy of exchanges, where a band of shorts was blown out to remove resistance and allow higher levels to return. These shorts were left over from Bitcoin's prior moves and were worth around 1,500 BTC. Looks like the previous bounce was shorted heavily and those shorts just got blown out. Hello and welcome to Money Talks. In today's video, Real Vision CEO Raul Pal updates about his outlook for blockchain technology in 2023. Raul also breaks down the benefits of regulations in the space and how they will drive the future of institutional adoption in crypto. Why am I doing this? Now, this is a really important for people to understand. So I first bought, bought Bitcoin in, at $200 in 2013. It went straight up to <clears throat> $1,000. And I'm like, I'm clearly George Soros. I'm the best investor the world's ever seen. 500% in three months. I'm a genius. It then falls 87%. And my time horizon was like five years plus. So I'm like, well, maybe probably 10 years because I wrote that first ever macroeconomic strategy paper about Bitcoin in 2013. So I said, okay, fine. So it's a call option. I'll let it go up and down. So it fell, didn't do anything, watched it. It rose 2017. I got confused over the staking wars, uh, the forking wars. And I'm like, mm, I don't know what's going on here. I'm going to take my money out. And I sold out at something like $2,000. So I've made 10 times my money, one of the best bets I've ever made, and watched it. Now, I'm still interested in crypto, but I just I thought it was it was in a bubble, and, and it was. It shot up 10x more to 20,000, then collapsed 85% or 82%, whatever it did that time around. And then I bought it again really well in kind of April 2020 when it fell into the middle of the wedge pattern. I bought it right at the right level. You know, I didn't get the absolute low, but let's say I got in about 6,500. And then I put in a much bigger bet than I did first time around. And great. So I went back recently and looked at it and thought, why well, if I just kept my original $200 in its original size? Because it looked like I traded it really well. I bought it here, I sold it here, and then bought it there. Problem is, is the here's and there's were all higher. Because I sold at 2000 and bought back in at six and a half. I fucked the whole thing up. Really, if I just held it, I'd have made five times as much money. And then the real magic unfolded is if I use the liquidity cycles and bought them every time we've had that kind of M2 fall down, M2 growth fall down, global M2 growth, bringing it back to the long-term uptrend. Had you just buy, bought then, i.e. crypto winters, even if you just missed the low by 30%, maybe more, I still would have done over 20 times better even accounting for the fact I put a lot more in in um, April 2020. So I've learned, many of us are having to learn how to trade a exponential asset that's in a logarithmic uptrend that is cyclical. Um, but that's, that's how I just deal with it now. I just use that simple framework. Is the adoption going on? And where are we in the liquidity cycle? And just use that. In anticipation of the March 31st macroeconomic data print from the United States, 
It appeared that traders were preparing for potential buying opportunities should the downside enter once more. Meanwhile, price is pumping. If bulls run out of momentum before clearing $28K, things may get spicy. Now, Bitcoin's relationship with the Fed balance sheet is really interesting because it goes up exponentially. So if I look at it versus M2 year on year or the Fed balance sheet year on year, it massively outperforms in the bull markets and then pulls back when the liquidity comes out of the system again. But it keeps going up. So, yes, I think there is a potential setup here for Bitcoin and the whole crypto market, actually, to be shockingly strong, more like 2013 than 2019. 2019, we had that big correction, and that was partly due to this G4, G5 central bank balance sheets. Some of them were contracting over that period of time, and it pulled back the crypto market. This time around, I don't think we're going to see that. I think we're going to see all of the central banks falling into place because there's banking issues both in Europe and the US and China has its own issues. So that they've all got the same issue, which is debt. They're all going to have to stimulate. So I think it's more likely to play out like 2013, which is very squeezy, then sideways consolidation, then very squeezy. Um, because, you know, every time we go through these cycles, more and more people understand what the benefit is of Bitcoin. And now we've got 300 million people that have used Bitcoin and other crypto. The next time around, it'll be a billion people or 600 million people or whatever the number is. And those people will have been awoken to the fact that there is another way out of this. Now, the issue is, as we all know, is Bitcoin is extremely volatile. So it's very hard to think of it in terms of, well, it's a wealth preservation asset because people's mind time horizon is too short. But if you hold it long enough, it does extremely well. It does better than the Fed balance sheet, better than any other asset in existence. But people get freaked out by the up and down move. But if they just zoomed out, they see it does a phenomenal job at opting out of the financial system over time. But you know, maybe you need to keep liquidity and other stuff for when you need it, as opposed to the, the crypto cycle, which can be quite vicious. You either kind of guarantee the system or you try and throttle it. My view is the US understands crypto, understands that it is the answer to the future, but they need to throttle it because if you create the bank run on the entire system, then the unintended consequences are simply gigantic. That's kind of everybody losing their jobs, the entire system breaking apart, the entire system of the United States as being the world leader or Europe and all of this falls apart. They don't want that, but they, I think they understand that there is a future here, but there's a battle to get people across because some people can't stand it. They don't like the idea of it. Other people understand it, but don't want it to happen too fast. And I, I get that. So I think that there will be an ongoing war. And if Balaji gets across what he wants to do, which is more get more people to move out of the system into the Bitcoin market, we'll see the pushback coming. But it happens very quickly because the mob is pretty fast, as we know. And the mob with a hive mind who's deciding, let's go to the parallel financial system, they can move really fast. So the government's going to try and stop it. But, you know, they do have, you know, as Punk6529 talks about, there is a freedom to transact here. You need the ability to do that. And if they go against that, then they're really trying to change the political spectrum entirely. And I think that the pushback would be so gigantic, but it is going to be a fight. But within this fight is a bigger world. The US has been down this route before. It tends to get self-protectory at various points. So after the the after Nixon left the gold standard, the US essentially had capital controls and foreigners wanted dollars and they couldn't get them. And the flow of dollars and foreign exchange was restricted by the US because they were protective. So what happened was England came up and went, well, we're going to have the FX market here because we don't have the same regulatory issues. We will create regulation to allow it to come. And it became the biggest market on earth. They then innovated again and in basically invented the euro dollar market. And London was the center of the euro dollar market. The euro dollars are all dollars that are traded that are outside the US system. And it's gigantic. It's much bigger than the US system itself. And that came out of London. And then it spread to global centers. But London was always the epicenter. So 
My guess is we don't know whether this government will last in the UK or not. But if it does, the UK will probably eat the US's lunch. And we'll see Coinbase, we'll see Kraken, we'll see Circle, we'll see everybody relocating to the UK because it's an easy, easy change to have. And don't forget, this is a trillion dollar industry. It's three trillion dollars at peak. What's it going to be at next peak? Five, ten trillion, probably. So, of course, the UK wants it because it's lost relevancy. So the US has to be very careful what it does here. I don't think it stops the people per se uh, getting involved. I think it tries to regulate that. That's all well and good. I think it's trying to stop the infrastructure layer being built and becoming too powerful, too decentralized. So they can regulate Coinbase and maybe they can regulate Circle, but they don't want too many moving parts in all of this. But if that's the case, if they're too heavy handed in a global world, that capital is going to flow elsewhere. And then every pension fund, sovereign wealth fund, hedge fund, anybody else wanting to do business in cryptocurrencies will go to London and they'll go to Singapore, they'll go to the UAE, they'll go to Hong Kong. Um, that's the way the world works. So what are your thoughts about Raul Powell's outlook on crypto? Tell us in the comments. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you soon with the next video. Thank you so much for watching.